says we're now streaming live on YouTube. Let's see if that's true. It says we're now streaming. Yeah, we're good to go. All right. Um, let's see if anybody's here. One watching. Let's, that's probably me, but let's begin. 601. Um, oh, Mercedes is joining. We're going to begin right after Mercedes connects. we'll let this go. I'll just begin and we'll, Mercedes will join in a second. Um, welcome everybody to the April 2021 meeting of the Pikes Peak Mycological Society. Uh, I'm Ben Kinsley. I'm president of PPMS for this year again, and um, we're going to begin our season remotely like we did last season. So if you watched um, any of our meetings last season because of COVID, obviously we were doing things remotely like this, uh, kind of Zoom presentations via YouTube Live. So uh, if you are a new member or you just started you know, getting into mushrooms or our club, uh, you can go back on our YouTube page, on our YouTube channel and watch all of the lectures from last year. And we had some really exciting presentations from people all over the world actually, um, which the remote presentation format allowed us to do that. Um, so that's pretty great. And the archive will continue this year. Everything that we present remotely will be also on YouTube. We do plan on getting back to in-person events this year. Um, our meetings are always open to the public and we will post information as we have it on our website. And also if members will get email notifications and we'll post on our Facebook group. Um, so, uh, we're going to begin this month meeting and April, the May meeting on Zoom. June is kind of TBA right now. Um, we're hoping July can be in person somewhere. Um, August and September, we will be back at our meeting location from a couple years ago, the Bear Creek Nature Center. And we'll end if possible, hopefully, uh, it sounds doable that we'll have a potluck for, for our members. Um, at the end of October. So just to let you know, it's always the fourth Wednesday of every month. So the meeting dates, which are posted on our website and in the new newsletter are as follows. So put these on your calendar and more information will come soon. May 26th, June 23rd, July 28th, August 25th, September 22nd, and October 27th, all at 6 p.m and we'll begin, like I said, remotely, and then when we can get back in person, we will do so. We're also gonna do forays this year, like we did last year. Um, uh, members, are, uh, forays are members only, so if you join PPMS, uh, you will get notifications when we go on forays, and Alyssa can talk more about this maybe, but uh, last year we did these signups and had people sign up ahead of time and reserve spots just so we knew how many people are coming. I think even with, if we, have fewer limits on gatherings you know, numbers, I still think that's a good idea. It helps us know who's coming and who to wait for and try to like figure out how big the groups are and how many leaders to have. So thanks for everybody who did that last year, stayed distanced and all of that, wore, wore masks this year. Hopefully we'll transition to a more normal season, but we will still do the sign-up sheet through uh, email. And remember, meetings are always open to the public and our forays are members only. I think that's all I had to announce. So I'll introduce my secretary, uh, Vice President Jennifer Bell. Hello. Okay. Um, scouting is starting, and uh, we're going to be doing a lot of it. There was great time had by all at Herbfest, and I, I'm thinking that's maybe going to be a regular thing to get people psyched for the year. It's nice to meet people in person and. We got a lot of bumper stickers out there and our brand new t-shirt in dark morel gray and light morel gray. Um, 
it's going to be a busy summer. We should try and ease ourselves back into the action after the weird year and a half we've had, but um, don't make any plans for August, okay? NAMA, that's the National Mycological Association, will be coming to Colorado this year up in Granby, which is right next door to Winter Park. So um, we are able to get you a $5 discount. All the details on getting tickets for the NAMA event, which is um, 18th to the 22nd, or is that Telluride? It's the week before Telluride. August Telluride. 12th to the 15th. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. And then Telluride is the week after the 18th to the 22nd. The, there's limited tickets this year. It's been getting more and more crowded. And then we had the sickness year. And so this year, we're just going to have to feel it out. But if you're dead set on going to Telluride for um, the Mushroom Festival, you should get your tickets sooner rather than later. Um, so there you go. Thanks for uh, tuning in tonight. And um, who's coming up next? Do we have Alyssa next? Hi, everybody. I am your official club secretary, again, and webmaster. Um, and I'm happy to be here with all of you wonderful people. I'm glad for everybody who joined online. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, so as Jennifer mentioned, we do have some shirts for sale this year, which we're super excited about. And for your viewing pleasure, we have our dark gray shirt. Let's see if you can see it. How's that? Easy. Um, that's the front. And then this is the back. I don't get the whole mirror thing, I guess. Um, anyway, this is the back of the shirt. So nice big logo on the back. And this is it in light gray. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Here we have light gray with some black letters. So that's nice. Um, we also have, and those are available in small, medium, large, extra large, and XXL. Um, XXL is $5 more. Um, the shirts are $30, $25 plus $5 shipping, basically. Um, so the XXLs are then $30 for the shirt and $35 with shipping. Um, you can place your orders online on our website at our new shop. Um, please check it out, pikespeakmike.org slash shop. Um, we also have these Eat More Mushrooms bumper stickers available for sale for $5. You can also order those online and they'll be mailed to you um, at pikespeakmike.com slash dot, sorry, pikespeakmike.org slash shop. Um, is it org or com? I don't remember. It's org. I just posted a link. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and Alyssa, uh, Jessica designed these. Um, Bumper stickers and Alyssa designed the shirts, so all in-house designs. Yes, and they're, um, yeah, they're pretty cool. So get yours, it's the first year that they're, the shirts are available. It's been a while since we've had shirts, like years and years. So get yours, look cool on our forays. And um, and that's it, that's all, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Alyssa. Thank you. And then next, our treasurer, Beth Leak. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Our very first meeting of the season. That's so exciting. So let's just hope for a great year. I'm going to show my screen to show you what our PPMS dues policy is. So this year, for new members, a one-year individual membership will be $30. And our one-year family membership will be $40. And if you're a new renewing member, then you get a discount of five bucks. So $25 for a whole year of four A's or for an individual and $35 for a whole entire family. And if you've got 25 kids that are under the age 18 and they live in your house, then they're free. And it's still only 35 bucks to take all of those kids on a foray. And then our lifetime memberships, our individuals are $3,300. Family memberships are $400. Um, again, 
all kids 18 and under are free. And you can make uh, your checks available to me at my address on the website. And then you can also pay by PayPal and you gotta click on the join button. And then you just need to hit um, whatever PayPal it is. And also too, it's the same way with the online shop as well. You can do all of that through PayPal too. I think that's all I've got. All right, thanks Beth. Um, and I posted a link to that also in the YouTube chat. Um, Jessica and Mercedes. So Jessica Langley and Mercedes Whitman are our co-newsletter editors. So if you guys want to talk a little bit about the newsletter. Sure. Um, the newsletter should be in your inboxes and your email. Um, if you haven't received it and you're a member um, this year, you should um, check your spam folder. Um, if you're not a member and you're just checking it out, you can access all the newsletters now on the ppms.org backslash newsletter. And there's a really great, there's some really great um, features in the newsletter this, uh, this issue. Uh, Mercedes Whitman wrote um, a piece describing her sort of long-term decomposition project where she decomposed her conver converse sneakers using um, oyster pleurotus um, species mycelium. Um, using in a, using a bucket and just having it in her backyard. So um, also we have um, some information from Isabel Gring, the club librarian, about the um, club library. So all the books are free to members to check out for a period of time. And you can contact um, Isabel. I think it's librarian at ppms.org through the email. And the full list of books that are available are on the website. So go ahead and check that out. Um, but anyway, just wanted to remind everybody that we can't really do the newsletter without people giving us content. So please contact us with ideas that you have. Um, we're always open to like seeing new pictures of different you know, forays and whatever it is that's mushroom related that you wanna share. Um, so please feel free to submit. Thanks, and Mercedes. You want to say hi? Hey, I don't have great internet, but I think I'm good right now. Um, yeah, Jesse, thanks for covering all of that. Um, I guess I would second that. Don't be shy about submitting to the newsletter. Um, and yeah, you can bounce ideas off of us um, and we'll work with you on that. It's pretty fun to participate in it. And um, we're also, going to be um, uh, offering the newsletter for anyone, even non-members and members alike, um, just to kind of share the information in it and what we're up to with uh, more of the larger Myco fam. Thanks guys. And the PDF archive is online. You can access that through the link I just posted also, but it's our newsletters page on the website. Um, James, so we're welcoming James Chellen to the, uh, to the group as an officer who's going to be one of our foray leaders this year. And also James is going to give the talk today. Uh, so James is very knowledgeable. He, he will get you excited, hopefully, for our first foray. But James, do you want to just introduce yourself and talk a little bit? Okay. Thanks, Ben. Um, my name is James. Uh, it's actually pronounced Shaleen, the last name. Just want to say that. Um, Really? And, uh, All time you didn't it tell? Is. It's okay. I know it's, it's, <laughs> it's different. Um, so I'm here to help and lead forays and help identify mushrooms. And I love doing that. And I love helping people learn. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very positive thing, I think. And uh, that's why I'm here. Some of our forays uh, this uh, year, depending on where we go, um, we may end up in a state wildlife area. And if we do, I just wanted to say that you either need a fishing or hunting license, or you need one of these SWA passes to enter. So this is especially important in the spring, but uh, throughout the summer, most of the time, I don't think we'll be a, in a state wildlife area, but um, just wanted to 
say that. And that's it. Thanks, James. We'll talk a lot more here coming up. But that's a new thing this year. Um, so it's really important for us to pay attention to that, especially if we have a group going together, you know, a lead foray on state wildlife land. So I'll post a link to that as well in the chat. So thanks, James. And then Brian, um, last but not least, Brian Barzi, uh, our board member at large. Um, do you want to tell us about what you've been seeing out there, scouting report, weather report, hopes for this season? Well, I think it looks pretty good. Of course, I was in the Midwest when I heard it was snowing here at my house. And I was pretty excited. I'm looking up at Pikes Peak right now, and there's still snow up there. Um, I think we're going to have to uh, get right out and start foraying. Um, uh, it really warm this weekend, but places that got moisture in our riparian areas, we should go and check out. And um, last time you'll see me on a Zoom meeting in a Colorado mycological t-shirt, because I'm gonna have a Pikes Peak mycological t-shirt on the next Zoom. So I'm pretty excited about all the work. What a great board this year and the continuance over from last year and all the effort. Um, I'm excited about NAMA, which is in a great place. It's worth the money. All the food is covered and everything there. Uh, when it's in that uh, YMCA camp location. And if we have good moisture this fall, it's going to be great. Um, uh, very inspired this year. I've even quit smoking cigarettes. Oh my gosh. Can't believe the energy I'm get feeling now after a long time smoker. It's like being sober all over again. So. <laughs> I'm charged and ready, and uh, I think it's going to be exciting. I'm, I'm open to as many forays as we can do, and hopefully our health and the health of the country and the health of the world will uh, get back to a normal flow, and we can all get out and enjoy uh, groups and clubs and mushrooms. Exactly. Thanks, Brian. Awesome. Um, I think that's everything else, everything we wanted to announce. Any other announcements that I, we forgot about before we move on? Renew your memberships or join the cl uh, club. I think it's going to be a great year for four A's. And even if it's not, we all need some outdoor time, right? So uh, it's a good year to get out there. Um, and we're going to try to do as many four A's as possible, like Brian said. And our scouts are out. James, Brian, Jennifer, everybody's been looking. We're going to be looking uh again this week and as soon as we see that the conditions are are good we will we will host uh we will host our first foray and like i said members will get in information about that via email um so get your memberships in order and we'll get the season started soon um awesome so i guess we can just jump in uh, we were going to start tonight's meeting off with a brief presentation from Alyssa about foraging ethics. Alyssa, do you want to take it away? I would love to. I'm going to share my screen with everybody. So tonight, you should see my screen now. Um, thank you for joining our season kickoff. Tonight we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk about foraging ethics. Um, please post any questions that you have as we go in the chat. And um, I think Ben said he's gonna be monitoring that or somebody will, so we can um, answer as we go. Um, sorry, I'm operating two screens here and I need to see my notes on one and the presentation on the other. So bear with me guys. I think I can just click. No. I will be monitoring the uh, YouTube chat. So Alyssa, if there's any questions, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so, Tonight's topics, we are going to discuss um, research and planning, public land rules and regulations, the type of stuff you need to bring with you, um, where you can find help with identification for your mushrooms, um, general rules of thumb and whatnot, and then helpful links, which I will briefly show you, but they will be posted um, on the website after, after this meeting so that you can access those links anytime you want to. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, let's talk about some research and planning. So planning, planning. 
planning is very important, especially um, especially this year, just with COVID and all of that. I know we're all sick of that word, but it is what it is. So um, what do you need to do to plan and research? Um, first of all, you need to get a good book, a, a guide. We like these particular two, the first two are favorites of a lot of us here at the in, on the board. Um, I think a good beginner's one is the Essential Guide to Rocky Mountain Mushrooms by Habitat. And then um, maybe a little slightly more advanced book is the Mushrooms of the Rocky Mountain Region, which are both excellent, excellent books. Um, I got the Mushrooms of the Rocky Mountain Region book first and it, it's amazing. I would definitely recommend it. Um, and then know what planning where you're going <clears throat> is super important. Most of the places um, that you're allowed to hunt mushrooms are gonna require a permit. So we'll go through that in more detail in a bit. And then you also wanna check the weather forecast as you are well aware, um, the weather changes often around here and it can differ from the side of the front range and to the other. So planning ahead by checking the forecast so that you know what to wear and whatnot is super important. You can avoid a very miserable time if you just check the forecast. Um, so now we'll talk about public lands. Um, sorry, let me advance to the next screen over here. Oh, I was supposed to do this. Sorry, guys. I'm a little slow. There, I made it fancy. Okay, public lands. Now, um, now let's talk about this. So national forests are um, excellent places to go hunting. Um, a lot of them require permits. Um, some of them don't. Pike National Forest, which is the one closest to us here in the Springs, and um, San Isabel is fairly close. I couldn't find any information on permit requirements on their website, and I did also try calling and wasn't able to get a hold of anybody. So I'm going to go with no information found and no permit required. Um, but it's up to you to be responsible and check that before you go hunting there. Um, Arapaho is not issuing any permits this year. Um, they do require a forest product removal permit in normal years. They'll have more information they said available in about four weeks from now, um, but due to the forest fires, they've got some restrictions happening. Um, Uncompagre and Grand Mesa, they do not require a permit as long as you're non-commercial. Um, you do want to check with the local office though, just to be sure. Rio Grande does not require a permit, um, although they have no rain this year. They're at like 0% to normal precipitation year to date. Um, so that's not good. Um, <clears throat> San Juan does not require a permit up to one pound. That's not very many mushrooms. Um, so you probably just wanna secure a permit. Your cost on that is gonna be $20. Um, I wasn't able to find any limits, um, but you wanna keep it within reason, I'm sure. White River, that is up by Vail. In, in that area, um, it does require a permit. It doesn't cost you anything, but you have to get one. If you get fined for not having one, you get, it's big fines. Um, you can just contact the local ranger district office there for more information. There are some weird things going on with COVID, like nobody's in the office. So um, just call in advance and figure out what you need to do to get that permit. And then um, Medicine Bow Route National Forest, um, they do require a permit, it's free. There is no commercial collecting. Of course, our club doesn't allow commercial collecting anyways. Um, and you do have a limit there of one gallon per day and up to five gallons per year. And you can get that permit from the local ranger district office. And moving along. Um, next land is the Bureau of Land Management lands. And, and I'm getting there. Um, and national parks. So BLM land um, does not require any type of permit. There is an up to five pound limit, non-commercial. National parks, you are not allowed to extract anything, not even with permit, just nothing, um, not even a rock. State parks varies park by park. You just need to call in advance. The only one I was I had time to get in touch with was Mueller. They don't require any sort of permit. Um, but if you're planning on going to a different state park, definitely call in advance, see what you gotta do. Private property, this is, um, probably common sense, but you can only hunt on private property with the express consent of the owner. I would maybe even get written consent um, with make my day law. You could get shot. You don't want to get shot. Um, next is, this is um, John, John, whatever his last name is, at Bureau of Land Management was actually nice enough to send me this email 
um, that shows you all of the limits for stuff that um, you're allowed to collect with no permit in the BLM lands. Um, so you can see it's actually kind of um, big. You can collect a lot of stuff, so that's nice. And this will be available later on so you can have this for your own information. State wildlife areas, James already touched on this, so we'll just glance at this briefly. Um, it, the new SWA pass is gonna be available May 1st, and it's the same price as the fishing license. It does also require a habitat stamp, which looks like this, it's fancy green, you can get it online. Um, we will have the link posted for your convenience. Um, if you do get caught without your, your pass, um, you can get fined 140 bucks. So it's cheaper just to buy the, the pass and be in compliance. Um, this is a map of Colorado public lands, not that exciting, but just so you can see that we do have a lot of public lands in Colorado. We're very lucky in that because many a lot of states don't have as much as we have. We're a little spoiled. Um, so now what do you need to bring with you? Clothing, um, of course, you need to plan, wear layers. If you're from Colorado, you already know this. Um, you wanna get really good boots. Um, or shoes, but something to protect your feet. Mine, I really like Red Wing, um, my Red Wing boots. They're amazing, they're waterproof, they protect me from snakes, they protect me from cactus, um, and they're just nice. And they last a long time. They're expensive, but worth it. Um, you want to wear tight-ish, not loose clothing, um, long sleeve shirts to protect you from the sun and the ticks. Um, you may even wanna consider getting a tick hat because the ticks will get you and they're disease ridden little nasty things. Um, you wanna make sure you are bringing water with you. Um, get a backpack with a hydration pack in it or just bring a water bottle, but stay hydrated. Um, high elevation and the sun don't go well together if you're not drinking enough water. You wanna bring your cell phone with you. You may or may not have service, but um, you can download your offline map to your cell phone so that you can at least know where you are. And of course, let somebody know where you're going before you go out, especially if you're going alone. You wanna bring something to collect your fines in. A basket is recommended by the forest service um, so that you can spread spores as you go along your path. And you wanna get a good mushroom knife, which you can get um, on any website really online. Amazon has a bunch and fungi.com also has a bunch or a couple anyways. Um, you wanna get your good field guide that we talked about at the beginning, your Vera books. Um, make sure you have your map and bring your common sense. You want to make sure you know what to do if you see a rattlesnake or a bear or whatever. Um, just make sure that, that you know what to do. Be aware of your surroundings and um, don't get lost. If you do get lost, you want to make sure if you plan on getting lost, you can get your Corsar card, which you can get for very cheap, five years, I think for $12 or something. And this is for the search and rescue guys. Um, it doesn't cover any medical expenses, but it does ensure that you'll at least get searched for. Um, and like I said, very cheap, five bucks. You can get it online, five or 12 bucks. Um, next slide, sorry. Um, okay, help with identification. So if you're gonna post stuff on to Facebook, our Facebook group page for ID help, make sure you get good pictures of the top side, underside of the mushroom and um, note the types of trees, substrate it was growing under, the terrain, the altitude, um, note the shape of the stipe and make sure you of course replace everything in the ground and tap it down if you pull. Um, and that is the forest, National Forest Service requires that you cut, but to I properly identify a mushroom, you have to pull it. So if you don't know what it is, don't pull out all of them that you see, just pull out one and then ID it and you can always go back for more. And your rules, general rules of thumb, um, the cutter pole, that's kind of, it's, everybody's different on that. Um, be a steward of the forest, bring your trash bag with you, pick up stuff as you go, just leave it cleaner than what you found it and don't leave anything behind. Either take what you're reasonably going to use. Um, you're not allowed to sell your products that you find. Um, it, that's club rules and that's also National Forest Service rules. Um, be very careful about damaging the plants and the trees and surrounding stuff. And remember that you're a guest in the forest. It's, it's not your home, it's home to the animals and we're a guest there. So we need to take good care of it and be polite. <clears throat> and know what to do in the event of an emergency. If you give it by rattlesnake, you got to know what to do. Make sure that you have your fishing license or your SWA license. Get your Corsar card and never eat a mushroom that you aren't 100% sure of its ID. 
and internet IDing doesn't count. Um, you want to, you can use the internet to help you confirm what it is, but you want to get your books and um, maybe even speak with an expert if you still aren't sure after your books. And that, oh, um, last thing. So if you want to go on forays for help with all of this stuff that I just talked about, finding and identifying mushrooms, um, please join the Pikes Peak Mycological Society today. You can do so online. Um, we host members only forays. You get a discount to attend the NAMA annual foray in Grand Bean. Um, you help support educational programs in the local community. Memberships do start at $30. Um, and you can join up at pikespeakmike.org slash join. And that concludes my portion of the presentation. So I'm going to give it to James. And he's going to be talking about a lot more fascinating things than ethics. <laughs> Thank you, Alyssa. That was great. And really you. helpful. Um, yeah, James. Yeah. Uh, Shalene. I can't believe I'm just learning that now after a long time. It's OK. <laughs> I'm used to it. Um, you're going to talk about how to get started hunting mushrooms in Colorado. And I know we have some new members, so this is a great way to start off the season. And like, I'm just going to reiterate and what Alyssa just said, and I know James will say this again, but the very best way to start learning about what mushrooms are is to go out in the field with people who know the area, who have done this before, um, join up with a club. If you're not in Southern Colorado and, you know, you know, we have a couple of clubs. There's the Colorado Mycological Society in Denver. We, I think we do more forays in, in a season and people sometimes come from Denver down to our forays, but it's really, really helpful when you're a beginner to start going out with people who are more knowledgeable because once you see things in person, it's the book, sometimes you're looking at it, you're like, what does that word mean? What color? I don't know what color it says that color or that smell. And I don't really understand it, but seeing it, in its natural habitat with somebody who has done this before is really, really the best way to learn. So James is a knowledgeable uh, foray leader and we'll kind of take it away and talk about how you got into this, right? Okay, thanks Brian, or I mean Ben. <laughs> I can't see him, Brian. So when I started, um, you know, I was always fascinated as a kid with mushrooms and the next thing you know, um, I, I saw something about 15 years ago near my compost pile, you know, a red mushroom and I never seen before. And it, it just, I was fascinated by it and I needed to know what it was. So I did everything I could to figure it out. And then I was talking to my aunt, um, who's, you know, lived in Colorado a lot longer than I had. And she knew about 10 different mushrooms and we started talking about it in depth. And I was like, that's cool. So, you know, one time I, I went down with her and you know, we found all kinds of stuff and I learned a whole bunch of stuff from her to get kind of get me going. Um, I did start with books, you know, this is one of my favorite books right here, David Aurora book. It's really small. Um, it's an older book, but it's got a, you know, great information in it for how small it is. Um, I love that book. And then I also got this one. It's one of my first mushroom books, The Edible Wild Mushrooms of North America by uh, David Fisher and Alan Bassett. And this has a lot of common mushrooms in it, but it has recipes and everything else. And so I like to cook. And so, you know, that was one of my other, um, you know, reasons for wanting to learn about, you know, edible mushrooms, because I wanted to, to experience stuff I could cook. And uh, that really got me, you know, even more into it. So I read through all these books, I learned all this stuff, but then I really had to get in the field to learn more. So, um, you know, by going out with other people, I went out with my aunt and that really just kind of got me going. And then I started meeting other people who did it. And then I just kept learning and learning and, and um, you know, it, it kind of became an obsession and that happens to a lot of people, I think. So let's uh, get started with the uh, screen sharing here. All right. So primarily what we're gonna talk about is there are <clears throat> mostly edible mushrooms in Colorado. And I like to talk about this because that's primarily what we do on our forays. We go out, we try to find something that we can eat. Um, I think a lot of people do. Um, I do think poisonous mushrooms are important to learn as well, but you know, typically you wanna go out and find a porcini or a chanterelle or something cool. And uh, we can get into poisonous mushrooms down the road here, but um, for this, it's gonna be the most basic uh, mushrooms. I think they're good mushrooms for beginners. They're easy to identify. They're good ones to learn. 
Um, and that's what we're going to start with. So uh, this is a picture of us uh, up near Woodland Park on a foray um, a couple of years ago. And uh, I think I remember that day we didn't find too much, but um, it was a good day in the woods, nevertheless. Um, so I always think about, okay, how, how would you want to get started? Obviously, join our club. Um, if you join us, it's only 30 bucks and you'll get to meet tons of people. You get to go on forays, go to meetings. You'll learn more, more about mushrooms than you ever thought you would know, um, guaranteed. So that's one of the number one ways that I would recommend. Um, on top of that, definitely get some books. Um, there's a lot of books for our area. There's a lot of books for just North America. Um, I think anything for Western uh, United States is probably best for our area because there's a lot of common stuff um, in, in the Mountain West um, and in all the different states. But Colorado is very unique and we have a lot of stuff that other people don't have. So if you join the club, you can attend forays. And then also <clears throat> I'd recommend get on our social media group on Facebook. Um, we have people post there all the time and you can comment. There's a lot you can learn. And then there's all, there are also websites. So um, one of the ways that uh, I got started was I started my own website, coloradomushrooms.com. I was thinking, hey, why don't I database the stuff that I'm finding and take pictures? And you know, it was, it was kind of a side project, which I don't have time to do a lot anymore, but um, I learned a lot just doing that um, on my own. And uh, that's still up and available. And uh, Mushroom websites are great. Um, another one that I like a lot is the uh, mushroomexpert.com. Uh, and there's tons of other ones too, but uh, that's a good way to go. So what do we bring? Um, you know, I, I think there's certain things that everybody should bring, like a knife. Um, but, you know, some of these things are subjective. Some people like to bring things that others don't. Um, these are some of the things that I like to bring. And then there's some of the stuff that you don't need necessarily it just depends on where you go or when, what time of year it is. Um, for instance, um, I always bring a basket and a knife. Sometimes I don't bring a basket. I'll just bring paper bags and put it in a backpack because I might not know what I'm going to find or if I'll find anything. And so it's nice to just be able to throw everything in your backpack, go for a walk, go for a hike. If you don't find anything, you don't, or, you know, oh, well, if you do, you have paper bags, you can pull it out and you can, you know, fill up a bag. Um, knives, you know, everybody has a different kind of knife they like to use. I prefer just a Swiss army knife um, or a fixed blade of some kind, you know, pocket knife, because then it's in my pocket all the time. I don't have to carry something big around or, or you know, anything like that. I, I like the simplicity of it. Um, I always carry water. Um, I always carry first aid. That's just, you know, something I always do when I go outdoors. And then I like to carry a rain jacket. And one of the reasons why is because, you know, August is our, is our big month hunting mushrooms in Colorado. And if you've lived here long enough, you know that we get afternoon thunderstorms almost every day in August, just about on good years. So there's been numerous times when I've been out, you know, too far away from the trailhead and it's really nice just to have a stuffed away rain jacket in your, in your pack. Um, another good thing would be like a small umbrella, which I didn't write on here. Um, but these are some of the things I thought about um, when I started thinking about this. Here's a picture of Ben uh, trying to get, you know, what's left of, uh, of a poisonous mushroom that we found by accident, um, but we already messed up <laughs> when we found it. But uh, that was a really cool day, memorable day. So to get started, I'm gonna start with the spring mushrooms and this is the stuff we're finding now. Right now, um, there are a lot of people posting pictures of these cottonwood oyster mushrooms. That's what I like to call them. They're uh, Pleurotus uh, pulmonarius. It's one of the first mushrooms we find in the spring. Generally, it depends on the moisture and we will find them anywhere from March into May. Um, really depends on how much snow we get or if we get rain. And then, uh, we also have the blonde morel, which I just saw today. Somebody posted a picture of two or three of them, and uh, that's a good sign. And I think we're we're likely to find some of those this year. Some years we don't find them. It really depends on how much snow we get and what the moisture is like, and how and what what happens with the weather. So um, we've had quite a bit of snow on the front range, I believe. So I think uh, 
you know, in the next week or so, we should be doing good with these two mushrooms in particular. Um, the cottonwood oyster, you know, always grows from cottonwood. This is a picture of a cluster I found um, right by the Bear Creek Nature Center. And, uh, you know, these were perfect when I found them right down by the creek down there. And what you'll find is that they'll often grow off the dead stumps or, you know, a, a piece of dead wood generally. They can grow on a live tree, but they usually grow on something that's dead. And a lot of times you'll find like a stump or something submerged under the ground, like a piece of wood that's touching the dirt and it's pulling moisture. And that's usually where you'll find them. Um, so anywhere along streams on the front range, um, anywhere you see cottonwood trees, you're gonna find these. They always grow in clusters. They're very easy to identify. Um, the gills always run down the stem. Um, they have a white spore print. And like I said, from March to May. And so we know there's lots of these out there right now. Uh, the blonde morel is a little trickier to find. You know, a lot of people look for these for years and never find one. It can be tough. Um, you know, if, if you're in the Midwest, it's a lot easier, but you know, in Colorado, it's hit or miss. It just depends on the year. Um, these are, can also be very difficult to see. Uh, they're a lot of times under, you know, in the grasses or underneath cottonwood trees, underneath leaves and things like that. They blend in really good with the ground when they're smaller. So you often don't see them until they get bigger. Um, they're usually along flood plains, along rivers and streams, generally the bigger streams um, under cottonwood trees. And uh, they are a choice edible. They're highly sought after. They're one of my favorite mushrooms to find um, as well as many other people, but it's tough. So um, right now they're just getting started. Um, like I said, I saw somebody post a picture today. So that makes me want to go. Um, generally, I wait till the very end of April to start looking. And, you know, this weekend is probably the first great weekend to start looking. Now I'm going to get into some summer mushrooms. These are some common uh, mushrooms that we look for in the summer. Uh, you know, the first one is obviously the King Belit, which is also known as the Porcini mushroom. That's the red one you see here in the bag. Um, these are very popular. Uh, with people in the summertime. In fact, a lot of people only look for those or only even know those. All these other mushrooms are kind of more secondary. Um, what I find, or at least what I've noticed, I find that I often find the hawk's wing when I'm looking for beliefs because they grow in the same habitat. They grow under spruce trees and um, at higher elevations generally. And uh, oops. And then we have a lobster, which we had great lobster mushroom forays last year. That was one of our one of our more abundant ones last year. And uh, it was a good thing. Then we have oyster mushroom, just like the one we talked about, but the ones that grow on Aspen. There are some agaricus species, which are similar to what you would find at the store. So like a portobello or a, a button mushroom, uh, same family. Um, chanterelle, these are one of my favorites. Um, they're hard to find sometimes, but once you find a patch or know an area where they where they fruit, note it down because you come back year after year. They may not happen every year, but they will happen um, if, once you find a spot. The black morel, that's probably one of the toughest ones to find unless you get lucky and get into a burn area that's just has a prolific fruiting, which some of us get lucky enough to do some years. This is the uh, King Belit. Um, this is typically what it will look like. Um, they can grow really, really big, you know, up to more than a foot in diameter. Uh, the bugs can really like them too when they get older, but when they get older, they get spongy. And, um, you know, I prefer them about a little bit smaller than this or, or up to this size when they're still firm. Um, I prefer to dry them because I can dry them on a dehydrator and I store them in a jar for later. And then when Thanksgiving rolls around, I'm making porcini gravy or you can make porcini butter and all sorts of different things. Um, I also like to grill them. Um, you take a cap with olive oil and you grill them, you know, salt and pepper face down and then flip it over and you can put like walnuts and cheese or sausage and cheese, all just any kind of combination. Um, I think that's a great way to go. They grow on the ground. They always grow generally under spruce trees. Um, there are, 
a few variations in Colorado, but this is the primary one you would find. Um, I would say the best area, best place to find these is from like 9,000 up to about 11,000 feet along a stream um, under spruce. It's very common. And some years we have lots of them, even away from streams. Other years, you know, they could be hard to find, just depends on where you go. Um, the Lexinum species is a lookalike. They're often uh, misidentified. I see a lot of uh, Eastern Europeans out there with both. Um, you know, I personally don't recommend eating the Lexinum species. Those are, they typically have a different stem on them. I wish I had a picture of it here, but they have a, what's called a scaber stock. And then when you cut them open, they stain different colors where the king believe will not stain and it will have more of a reddish cap um, that's shinier, where the Lexinum one that looks reddish, that's a lookalike, is, is duller. It's not as shiny at times. This is another form of a King Belit. Um, it's called the White King Belit. It's named after uh, Chuck uh, Barrows, who was a <coughs> famous mycologist down in New Mexico. These grow anywhere in the Southwest. Um, some years you can't find them. Other years they're everywhere, it just really depends. Um, the bugs really like them too. So it's important to find them fresh, but they grow generally under ponderosa pine at lower elevations where it's warmer. So as soon as they fruit, you gotta get on them. Um, otherwise they get spongy and you know bug ridden really quickly, but they're, in my opinion, just as good as the king belief back here. Um, but that's one of the variations. This is, uh, the lobster mushroom right here on the right. We find these uh, generally under ponderosa or lodgepole pine as well. And uh, this is something we found, you know, tons, oops, we found tons of these last year um, on our forays. We did multiple forays week after week and just kept finding more. And this is an interesting one because it's actually a parasitic fungus that grows on certain species of what I like to call Russula. And I hear uh, a lot of experts say Russula, and I wonder why, because I don't see an H in there, but um, I like to call them Russulas. And this mushroom on the left is called a Russula brevipes, and that's a, a white mushroom that is technically edible. I've never eaten one, but this uh, parasitic fungus will attack it and then turn it into this lobster mushroom and turn it, turn it into something that's a choice edible, which we all prefer. Um, and I love finding these. I just love finding them because of the color, um, they look like a, an orange peel sticking out of the ground. In fact, one of the first times I found one, I was walking down a trail and I looked down and I, I was like, why did somebody throw their orange peel, you know, on the ground? And I look and then I realized it was a mushroom. And so that's kind of one of the ways to identify or to, to find it. You'll see what looks like an orange peel. Um, here's a couple of pictures of what it would look like, you know, under pine needles. A lot of times you won't find them right away because they're buried, um, but you walk around, all of a sudden you'll find one, you start looking around, you'll start finding groups of them. And uh, these grow under ponderosa pine generally is where we find them. And uh, it's a great mushroom to find. I like drying this one as well. Um, so that's that. This is our black morel, one of them. There are many. I believe in Colorado, different versions of this. Um, they're still being named to species. And that's why I have just Marcella species up here because it's hard to keep up with the different ones that, you know, we're, we're naming. There, there's, there's different ones, there's burn morels, there's some that aren't in the burn, um, but they generally like a lot of moisture, the ones that aren't in the burns that I found. I found them growing in water. Um, all over Colorado. And this is one that's really hard to find for people because it looks like a pine cone. And it's so easy just to walk right past it and never even know it's there until they get larger, especially when they're smaller. Um, these will start uh, into May and, you know, they're hit or miss. It just really depends. And, uh, you know, they're, they're highly sought after because they're very good. This is the uh, Aspen oyster, I like to call it. Uh, Pleurotus uh, populinus. This is one of my favorites to find. I like it a lot better than the cottonwood oyster. I don't, it just tastes better to me. Um, this is another one that the bugs really like to get to. So, you know, generally towards the end of July, 
you'll start finding these fruit off of Aspen um, after afternoon rains. And uh, it's best to find them fresh and they're, they're great. Um, they always grow in a cluster. They're always grown from wood. They'll never grow from dirt. They're always, you know, if, they, if you see them on the ground, it's because there's a piece of wood under the dirt. And these always grow in Aspen, generally dead or dead Aspen or on stumps. Um, one thing that I noted one year, I was camping with some friends and we were, we were hunting mushrooms and in the Pike National Forest and it got dark and, and we look up and we saw one up in a tree and it was glowing. So if you see these at night, they, they will uh, they, they glow in the dark, which is really interesting. Um, again, they usually grow in a cluster. And if you look at the picture on the right, you'll see the gills always run down the stem. I often hear or see people misidentify oyster mushrooms um, simply because they don't look for the gills going down the stem. You know, they see a cluster of white mushrooms on something and they assume they're oyster mushrooms. So never assume that always look for the proper characteristics. And so gills running, running down the stem is a big one. And the other one is growing on wood, aspen. Um, white spore print, you'll often see white spores underneath them when they're growing. It's a very good beginner mushroom if you ask me, because there's very easy ways to identify it. This is what we call the hawkswing. Um, some people like this mushroom. I honestly don't prefer it. Um, and that's just because it's a flavor thing, you know, we all like different things. My aunt loved this mushroom. So every year when I go out looking for uh, belites, I would find tons of these and I would collect them and I would dry them and I would always give her a jar every year. And I would say, hey, here's your mushrooms. And she would be very happy about it. Um, she actually called them a scaly urchin, which I thought was interesting because nobody else calls them that. Um, but they're very easy to identify. Um, they have, uh, you know, the top is very unique. And then if you were to look on the bottom, they don't have gills, they have spines. Um, so it's a, it's a mushroom with spines. It grows uh, under spruce generally along streams and stuff at higher elevations. Um, I always find them around 10,000 feet, find tons of them every year. They're, they're pretty abundant and it's a great beginner mushroom because it's, there's, there's not really a lot that looks like this. Um, and uh, it's a great one to learn because once you, once you learn this one, you know what it is every time. This is the uh, golden chanterelle here on the left-hand side. Um, I love finding these. I do not like cleaning the dirt off of them, but um, I will do anything to clean them because they are one of my favorites. Um, I love cooking these in a, with like a cream sauce or something. And, uh, you know, I find that they smell like apricots when I find them, they smell very fruity. And uh, once you find them, you get really happy and you start looking around for more. Um, I put a picture here of this uh, false chanterelle because this is one that's very easy to, for beginners to confuse. And again, a chanterelle has gills going down the stem. If you look at the picture on the, on the left, you'll see that main one has gills going all the way down the stem. Um, they're actually not gills, they're ridges, but that's one way to identify it is that it's gonna smell fruity. It's gonna have gills going down the stem like that. Um, the one on the right, you'll notice it looks similar, but the gills stop and they don't go down the stem. They're also not as robust. So the stem is smaller and, um, you know, people could misidentify this very easily. And oftentimes when you find the false chanterelle from the top, it looks like you found them and you get excited. And then once you pull them up and you notice the gills don't get down the stem and they don't smell fruity, um, that's not the right mushroom. So. I thought it was important to put this here because that's a common thing. Okay, agaricus. So I like agaricus mushrooms because they're similar to what you find at the store, um, only better. And this is from a foray that we did, I believe last year. Um, I was out with Ben and uh, we said, hey, you know, look, look at the stages of this. So this is, uh, of the agaricus compestris variety, which um, is debatable as far as species because there's still naming them, but um, it's in that group. And you'll see the one on the far right is still in the button stage and then they, you know, the gills turn pink and that's why they call it a pink bottom. 
And then uh, as they mature, the gills start turning brown and they start dropping spores. But these are very similar to the button mushroom in the store. Um, I think they're great. We find them out in, out in the sun, out in meadows. Um, you know, other mushrooms like it, you know, where it's cooler and where there's shade, but these um, become very prolific out in the meadows in the cow pastures and stuff like that. And uh, this is a great edible to find. So we enjoy going on forays to find those. Um, here's another version of that on the left here. And then uh, the other one I want to talk about is called the woodland agaricus, the agaricus sylvicola here on the right. Um, that's a common one we find. Typically I find that by accident looking for other mushrooms. And uh, it's always a pleasant thing to find, I think. Here's some more from the uh, compressors group. These are, this is from a foray we did last year. We were finding tons of them. So I just want to take a picture of, of a handful of them. You know, they don't get too big. That's one of the characteristics is they're a little smaller. Um, the gills are generally pink. And, uh, you know, once you learn this one, it's, it's pretty easy to identify. And I think it's a great uh, agaricus for beginners. Um, I find agaricus are very fascinating, but they can be very tricky to name the species because there's so many different ones and a lot of them look the same. And so this is one that's one of the easier ones to identify based on where it grows, how big it is. Um, it doesn't have standing like some of the other agaricus do. And um, I, I think it's a great one. This is the woodland agaricus, agaricus sylvicola. It's a little bit bigger. And there's a few that grow in the woods, you know. Um, I generally find this a lot under ponderosa pine or other conifers, but um, it's very unique because when you find it and you smell it, especially like this one on the left here that's not matured too much, they smell very almondy. And I remember um, when I found these, I was with uh, Brian Barzee and we, we were driving down the road and we're like, hey, wait a minute, there's some mushrooms back there. And we went back and looked and, you know, there were about 10 or 12 of these and we got all excited and, you know, they just smell very almondy. They have a very unique smell. And then they also can stain a little bit golden yellow colored. Um, and they, they often do grow with ponderosa pine. So these are fairly easy to find and identify. And, um, you know, there are other similar agaricus that are poisonous that are similar, but they don't smell like these at all. And they don't turn a golden color. They stain more brighter yellow. And generally it's at the base when you cut the base open. Um, but this is the other agaricus that I like to find just because it's a great one when you're looking for something else and you don't find it, but then you always run into a few of these and it's, it's, it's nice to take home. This is a foray that we did um, in the wet mountains um, where we brought all the mushrooms together and we had Larry Evans talking about all the different ones and uh, Britt Bunyard came and uh, we had a great day that day. We found all sorts of different things. And this is what I like to do is to get all the people together you know, find all these different types of mushrooms and then explain the differences and what's what and how we identify it. And this is a great way to learn. So if you join with us, go on forays, you're gonna be able to go out and do this sort of thing and you'll learn more about mushrooms than you ever thought. So that's it for my presentation. Um, I will uh, give it back to Brian now and see if we have any questions. That was pretty good. Um, I would just add one thing to that. Um, the Hygrophoropsis arantiacum, our false chanterelle, is always growing on wood. And our chanterelle is always a terrestrial one. But um, just like James said, if you look close and you smell them, uh, you definitely can tell the difference and you won't be tricked. Uh, you don't want to eat that arantiac and it won't kill you, but um, it will give you 24 hours of wishing you were in some other place other than the bathroom. <laughs> yeah. And I think it could easily be misidentified by a beginner. And that's why I wanted to throw it in there. I thought it was good. It is. That was, that was a really good clip to put those two together. Um, I don't have anything else. I think it's going to be great. Uh, James, is a wonderful 4A leader. We really, really are lucky that he's joined the club full-time this year and did a great job on your first lecture with the club. Amazing and wonderful. And with that, I'll, I'll 
stop and, and mute my microphone and turn it over to our president. And thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I mean the fall the fall Chandrel, like my first one of my first years here, I was with Jennifer actually and uh, got really excited. And then it's a false Chandrel. And I still haven't actually found I find chanterelles everywhere else I go, but I still haven't found any in Colorado. Um, but yeah, I found fall chanterelles in Ohio. And when you are feeling desperate for mushrooms, you can maybe even if you know better, convince yourself that something is what it isn't, you know? So, right. yeah. Um, another thing with, with the chanterelles in Colorado, you'll generally find really small ones mm -hmm. and, and, and they look a little different. So, I mean, unless you're experienced with it, you might overlook it. Um, and you know, those bigger ones like that were in that picture, you don't always find them that big, you know, in other States they find them really big and prolific. But ours are usually a little smaller. And I find actually the oyster mushrooms here, the bolites are so much bigger than on the East Coast. So I don't understand why. Uh, maybe somebody knows, but I don't really know why things get so big here sometimes uh, with less, seemingly less moisture. Um, we have a couple comments in the chat. Uh, thanks for hosting, James. Um, this presentation was so helpful. Great photos. Uh, oh, this might be a question for Alyssa because Alyssa posted that you love hawk swings. They're so yummy. And somebody asked, how do you prepare hawk swings? Alyssa, what's your favorite way of preparation? Well, glad you asked. Um, I'm simple, simple person. I just like butter, fry them in butter and with garlic and wine. Yep. I would say butter and garlic too. I mean, if you like a regular, you know, store-bought mushroom, cook them the same way very similarly. Um, they vary too in the taste. Like the younger ones are definitely better than the old, than the bigger ones. Yeah. That's what I was going to say too. Uh, it, it's one of the ones that I consider edible where the other ones you consider choice, you know, so uh, it just varies on the people, you know. I think it's so it does, totally. That's one that across the board, there is nothing like a hot swing to get people to decide whether or not they like to eat those. I myself love those in a red sauce, like a marinara sauce. I think they're outstanding. Um, Eddie's dad, a past member, uh, came out from Virginia and pickled them, and they were fantastic pickled. That sounds good. I really like those. There's a couple different species of uh, those toothed fungi, and they taste different, but our standard all-purpose hawkswing is... Um, it's open to debate. And just like James said, there's a lot of people that don't care for those. And there's some that swear to those. And so um, I guess I'm in the swear to them. I love them, but uh, I like to share them too, because they're often way more plentiful than beliefs. I'm just pickier, you know, because I don't like to eat anything that's edible. I like to eat what I feel is the best, <laughs> you know, um, but to each their own. Um, the great thing about the hawkswing is it's very abundant, you know, so once you find a few, you, you're you probably going to find a bunch of them, you know, and, um, and relatively easy to identify and feel right. safe. Uh, it's a great, it's a great beginner mushroom, I think. Yeah, there's a good beginner book, actually. I, remember, I think it's just called Mushrooming Without Fear. I remember a friend of mine gave, uh, let me borrow that early on, and it's just talking about mushrooms like oysters, um, morels, things that are, are not gilled mushrooms, actually, except for the, the oyster, right? Uh, basically everything, because the, the general idea is that the more, most deadly poisonous mushrooms are have gills. And if you avoid gilled mushrooms at the beginning, you can kind of get into this without feeling too scared. Right. Well, there's also very few deadly poisonous mushrooms. And, and I'd love right. to, to touch on that sometime. Yeah. Um, you know, the majority of the ones that are poisonous, like Brian was saying about the, uh, the false chanterelle are going to give you a stomach ache, you know, um, I, I can only think of like four or five that might kill you maybe, you know, yeah, out of thousands. And talking back to the, uh, idea of edible good and choice, I think Gary Linkoff's book, um, the Audubon guide to North American mushrooms, it's edible good and choice edible is like yes you can eat that <laughs> but it's like you don't i probably don't want to eat that you know uh good is kind of like yeah that's okay i can i guess that's edible and choice is like you're like oh yeah that's there's a big difference between choice and good right and i prefer all the choice ones like i would never eat a hideous gumphidious and it's just because 
the thing looks, you know, like something I wouldn't want to eat, you know, and I was foraying with somebody who, who learned it and, and, uh, you know, one of our members and she's like, this is the most beautiful mushroom. I think it looks great. And I'm like, well, it's edible, but you know, I wouldn't touch it. <laughs> and it's just because the way it looks like it's something that I wouldn't want to cook for some reason. I mean, it might be good. I have no idea, but you know, I think the first time you eat any mushroom, like this is one rule of thumb that we talk about that you don't want to find a bunch of stuff and eat it all at once. If you've never had that right. before, because even choice choice edible mushrooms some people can it just, just disagrees with their body so uh, it's a good rule of thumb when you if you're finding mushrooms for the first time don't cook them all up in one thing cook them individually so you can get a sense of their taste and cook them kind of without too much other flavor the first time so you can really understand what that mushroom tastes like if you like it if, you know if it agrees with you because not even if something that says it's a choice edible in a book it doesn't mean that you will like it or your body will like it that are, you know, some mushrooms can't be undercooked, you know, so right. like, I think morels should be cooked, make sure they're cooked enough. And um, same thing with like a honey mushroom, mm -hmm. you know, you, you want to make sure those are cooked, you know, well enough or, or they, you could get an upset stomach from it. Um, and then, and then you have allergies like a peanut allergy, for instance, some people can't eat peanuts. Well, you could find some mushroom that you disagree with, you know, it's a very good possibility, but probably not most people, but it can happen. Um, I don't see any more questions right now. Um, that was good. And we we were right on the hour mark. So thank you guys for being concise and clear. And I think we got some people excited for the season and we will keep you guys posted. Uh, as soon as we go on a foray, um, you guys will get emails and just make note of our next meeting, uh, Wednesday, May 26th at 6 PM also on zoom. And then after that, maybe we'll be back in person. So, awesome. uh, yeah. I look forward to that. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I look forward to uh, getting out with my mushroom wife, Jennifer, and going to do scouting this week. So hopefully we can find a spot for the club to go pretty soon. And uh, thanks all. Great meeting. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.